All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here at Whiteboard and Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. How is everybody doing today? We are coming off a stretch of um, shifts both in the ICU and the emergency department, actually. I had a couple interesting cases. Had a young lad um, who actually came in with alcohol withdrawal and epigastric pain. If I could just take a quick 60 seconds of your time, I wanted to introduce our newest Whiteboard Medicine emergency and critical care community, and that is our Patreon community. Here we post emergency and critical care medicine medical education topics every other day. We focus on landmark trials, new trials, clinical pearls, bedside tips and tricks, and much more. Everything emergency and critical care. We also upload study guides for each video. We have practice tests. And our newest addition is going to be mini courses that kind of lay out video study guides, practice questions um, into an easily digestible form that we hope is very applicable and helpful to the bedside. Our goal is to try to get even 1% of our YouTube community to join our Patreon community. It would be incredibly helpful in allowing us to spend more time creating content and elevating our current content. We appreciate you all and we hope to see many of you there. Uh, lo and behold, the epigastric pain from the alcoholic pancreatitis. It was mild pancreatitis, though just some interstitial edema on CT scan, uh, no significant end organ injuries. But during his stay, he had this progressively worsening tachycardia. You know, initially it was thought to be maybe SIRS criteria from the pancreatitis with alcohol withdrawal, um, but it seemed discordant to kind of the rest of his alcohol withdrawal symptoms as well as the severity of his pancreatitis. So as one does, we put a probe on his chest, an ultrasound probe on his chest, and this poor young guy uh, had new biventricular failure. You know, his EF qualitatively on the bedside ultrasound was around 10% uh, with right ventricular dysfunction as well. So that was obviously a surprise. That was a, you know, sphincter puckering moment. Um, and uh, lucky that we we did end up putting that probe on his chest and identifying it because uh, he ended up needing some mechanical circulatory support and all those things, but uh, did end up having a good recovery, which is great. Um, certainly needs to abstain from drinking in the future. So that was one of the interesting cases we had. Let us know if you all have any interesting cases, thoughts, all that good stuff. And today we'll dive into the shock index. Um, so we're going to be talking about the shock index today. It won't be a very long episode. We'll talk about what the shock index is, why it matters, normal and abnormal, clinical approaches, some of the evidence behind it, strengths, limitations, and we'll do some practice questions at the end. Uh, as a reminder, this study guide is on our Patreon page, as is all of our other stuff. Um, so definitely check that out if you want the study guide or want to just join us on Patreon. Lots of good content on there. Uh, no further ado, shock index. What is the shock index? Well, the shock index is the ratio of the heart rate to systolic blood pressure. Literally simple division, right? Heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. And this makes a little bit of sense when we get in why it matters. Because the shock index is a good assessment tool that kind of gauges pending hemodynamic instability. All right. It often is better than just looking at heart rate alone or systolic blood pressure alone. So when we're using the shock index, we're using this to say, is this a patient who is at high risk for further decompensation? And we'll talk about the scenarios in which it's been validated, but when we think about what this means, what we're actually looking at, it makes some conceptual sense, right? Because this picks up on some of those subtle patients that maybe aren't overtly hypotensive yet. They just have some low-grade tachycardia. Their systolic blood pressure is normal, but on the lower end of normal. And if you're not taking your time and being thoughtful, you might pass up that patient as quote-unquote stable right? But if you do their shock index, and let's say they have a heart rate of 90, so not that high. That doesn't even show up as red, right? That's a normal heart rate. And let's say their systolic blood pressure is 100 millimeters of mercury. You know, that shows up as normal too on most EMRs. But this patient's shock index would be 90 divided by 100, which would be 0.9. And we'll get into abnormal, but this is an abnormal shock index because what's actually happening is this patient's heart rate is increasing to compensate for their blood pressure that's slightly decreasing. So that's what our body does, right? Our body increases the heart rate to maintain cardiac output when our systolic blood pressure is decreasing. Or if we want to be more specific, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So what's actually happening is the stroke volume is going down and to maintain cardiac output, our heart rate goes up. And some of these low-grade tachycardias are actually compensatory mechanisms to maintain cardiac output. And when the systolic blood pressure 
pressure is still normal, that's effective, right? That's successful. That's working. But that systolic blood pressure then starts to drop because the heart rate can't keep up. The compensatory mechanisms can't maintain cardiac output, and that blood pressure starts to drop. And the shock index is supposed to be a way to identify when we're starting to kind of tip over that edge a little bit, okay? It's simple, right? It's a bedside tool. You go in the room, you look at the vital signs, everyone can calculate a quick shock index. And it usually outperforms heart rate or systolic blood pressure alone in detecting that occult shock, that end organ injury or that impending doom before a patient is overtly hypotensive. So let's get into normal and abnormal values. So a normal shock index just for someone walking around in the world is somewhere around 0.5 to 0.7, all right? So less than 0.7 is considered normal. Borderline is 0.7 to 0.9. This is, you know, maybe early risk. And a lot of people uh, will quote actually 0.8 as the magic number. Anything greater than 0.8 is kind of a positive or abnormal shock index. Um, this we put 0.9 because there's kind of this 0.7 to 0.9 range that is gray, unclear. There might be some impending risk. And then if the shock index is greater than 0.9, this is associated with kind of impending badness, you know, future decompensation, need for massive transfusion, need for ICU admission, even mortality, right? All this uh, shock index of 0.9 is correlated with all of these things. And again, this can be really valuable to detect early on. Very high, you know, a shock index greater than 1.3, 1.5. This is certainly associated with really poor outcomes. So the higher, okay, the higher the shock index, the more concerned you should be, right? Even if someone's overtly hypotensive, you know, and you don't need a shock index. So let's say someone's systolic blood pressure is 60 and their heart rate is, uh, I should have made the math easier, 120. That's going to be a shock index of two, you know? And we know, we don't need the shock index to know that someone with a stock blood pressure 60 is on the cusp of death. Um, but right, the higher the shock index, the worse that is. But the shock index is really the most helpful in some of these gray cases when there isn't overt hypotension yet, but the heart rate's a little higher than would be physiologic, and the stock blood pressure is a little lower than would be physiologic. And that magic number is somewhere around 0.8 or 0.9, um, depending on what you look at and who you talk to. So clinical applications for this, we've hinted at a handful of them, but let's just sp spell them out. The shock index kind of originated in the trauma and hemorrhage literature. And a shock index of greater than 0.9 in patients who sustain trauma or are bleeding is correlated with an increased likelihood of future significant hemorrhage and need for massive transfusion. And I said future significant hemorrhage, but that's probably not fair, right? That patient is having hemorrhage. It may just not be clinically, you know, noticed yet. But a shock index of 0.9 in those trauma populations is correlated with a need for massive transfusion in the future and significant hemorrhage. Um, and in some studies, it's actually more sensitive than the systolic blood pressure of less than 90 in predicting mortality. Obviously, this is trial data, and there's certainly limitations to that, those comments, but I think it's valuable in just kind of contextualizing how important the shock index marker can be. What about sepsis and infection? Well, a shock index greater than 0.8 or 0.9 in patients who are septic is associated with a higher risk of ICU admission and mortality in sepsis. All right. It can be useful. Some EDs, emergency departments, use it as kind of a triage risk stratification tool. Um, it can certainly be useful in that context because, uh, again, it's free. All you need is a heart rate and the systolic blood pressure. Pulmonary embolism and cardiogenic shock, shock index is also correlated with future decompensation and higher mortality risk. And in pregnancy, there's something called the modified shock index that you can use. The literature on this isn't as robust, um, but pregnant patients have a lower baseline systolic blood pressure and a higher baseline heart rate. So you can't use the classical shock index, but you can use something called the modified shock index or the MSI. And that is heart rate divided by MAP, actually. So the normal shock index we talked about is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. The modified shock index is heart rate divided by MAP. And the magic number here is greater than 1.3 may indicate risk of decompensation and obstetric hemorrhage. But evidence here is weaker than for kind of the quote unquote classic shock index. So something that I would suggest and something I do, you know, you walk in the room and just start training your brain to just look at the systolic blood pressure and the heart rate and just calculate a quick shock index in your brain, right? Because that can help you understand uh, if this is a patient that maybe you should be a little more worried about than you were initially. Strengths and limitations. Strengths is it is simple. 
It is fast. There's no equipment needed beyond vital signs. It's in some studies more sensitive than hypotension alone, and it's predictive of mortality, transfusion needs, ICU admission. So lots of strengths here. Um, again, a great marker. Limitations. A big thing to note is this is obviously influenced by patients who are on AV nodal blocking agents, right? Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, because their heart rate's going to be lower because they're on an AV nodal blocking agent. So it's not going to be accurate in that population or patients who are pacemaker dependent or patients who maybe just have a little bradycardia at baseline for some nonspecific reason. So just know this isn't the end all be all. Don't be falsely reassured if someone's on a home metoprolol and their shock index looks great, right? That's not useful in that population because they're on beta blockers. Um, it can be less reliable in tachyarrhythmias as well, right? Someone who's an AFib with RVR or, you know, a flutter with RVR or SVT or VT or whatever you want to put on there. Um, obviously, these are tachydysrhythmias. This is not the native heart rate. This is not sinus tachycardia. So none of uh, these are shocking. The indices are going to be accurate if they're in an arrhythmia to start with. And then obviously use this in the clinical context. It's not diagnostic by itself. Think about what's going on, but it's a useful marker. Uh, it's easy. It's quick uh, and it's pretty much free because everyone's getting vital signs. The evidence here, just to spell it out, um, as we talked about in the trauma literature, shock index of 0 0.9 can predict need for massive transfusion. We've seen that in studies. In the sepsis literature, a shock index can be predictive of ICU admission and mortality. We've seen that in studies. And in obstetrics, although the evidence is not as robust, that modified shock index, right, that heart rate divided by MAP can be an early detection marker for hemorrhag uh, hemorrhagic shock for these patients. All right, we're getting towards the end. Like I said, quick episode here. So here's a quick reference guide. Again, this is uh, on our Patreon page if you need it. The formula for the shock index is shock index equals heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. Normal is less than 0.7. Abnormal is greater than 0.9. And a shock index greater than 1.3 is a really high risk of mortality and ICU need. You can think about using this in trauma patients, septic patients, obstetric patients, PE, cardiogenic shock patients, uh, and maybe there'll be more data out there uh, on other patients to use it in the future. Uh, this is limited by meds like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. It's limited by arrhythmias, uh, and it can be limited just kind of some baseline physiology, right? Someone who's just got chronic bradycardia uh, or chronic tachycardia, I suppose, uh, for nonspecific reasons. All right, let's get into a couple practice questions. For those of you new to this channel, the way the practice questions work is I'll read the question and the answers. I'll pause quick and then I'll go into the answer. So if you need more time to think about it, just pause the episode um, because I'm going to go right into the answer after I read uh, the answer options. So beginner question, a 25 year old man presents after a motor vehicle crash, heart rate is 110, blood pressure is 100 over 70. What is the shock index and how should it be interpreted? So heart rate 110, blood pressure 100 over 70. A, 0.7 normal. B, 1.1 an abnormal, suggesting occult shock. C, 1.5 indicates imminent cardiac arrest. Or D, 0.5 bradycardia. Correct answer, pause here if you need to, is B. So heart rate of 110 and systolic blood pressure of 100 is 110 divided by 100, which equals 1.1. This is obviously a high shock index that's greater than the 0.9 we talked about, which means it's abnormal and you should be concerned for kind of occult hypoperfusion or impending shock, right? So that correct answer is B. All right, next question, intermediate difficulty. 55-year-old woman with pneumonia has a heart rate of 120, blood pressure of 110 over 70. Their shock index is 1.1. She appears comfortable but has a rising lactate. What does this shock index suggest? A. She's stable, no intervention needed. B. Elevated shock index suggests increased risk of decompensation despite the fact she is normotensive. C. Shock index is not useful in sepsis. Or D. Shock index indicates immediate need for transfusion. Pause here if you need to. The correct answer is B. Elevated shock index above 0.9 in sepsis suggests higher mortality or ICU risk, even if the SBP appears adequate. And this is that patient where that shock index can be really helpful. This patient's blood pressure was 100. 110 over 70. That is normal in you know, every EMR out there, but their heart rate was 120. So their heart rate is trying to compensate for something and it's doing it successfully. It's maintaining the blood pressure, but that shock index is high. That shock index is 1.1, 1 .1, 120 divided by 110. And that is greater than that 0.9 and greater than 0.9 we know is correlated with poor outcomes. All right, last question, advanced. A 70-year-old man with blunt trauma has a heart rate of 105, blood pressure of 95 over 60. Their shock index is 
Um, oh, shoot. We have failed you all. Uh, this question has an age-adjusted shock index, which we chose not to include in this episode. We forgot. We, we originally included it and then uh, took it out, uh, but I forgot I left this question in here. Well, if anyone wants to know about the age-adjusted shock index, certainly give us a holler, and we can uh, make a future episode on it. Apologies about that. Um, we have um, a lot of additional videos coming out on some of this great kind of emergency critical care physiology and pathophysiology stuff stuff, things that you can use at the bedside, things that you certainly should be know about, that you certainly should know about uh, if your target's to be a great resuscitationist, uh, and Shock Index is one of them. So stay tuned, subscribe, hit the bell button, follow along, uh, check out our Patreon page. We got a podcast as well with all these episodes if you prefer listening to them through audio, uh, and we have a newsletter too, so um, we'd love for you to hop on board with any of that stuff. Nonetheless, we appreciate you all. Stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.